the majority. Talk now to Harry and Nadelko, Director of Policy at Rasmussen Global. He joins us uh, from uh, Brussels in Belgium. Good morning, Harry. Nice to see you again. Good morning. Thanks for having me again. Uh, let's, uh, this case of these Americans and other foreign fighters arrested by uh, Russian authorities or Russian-backed authorities while uh, uh, fighting for Ukraine, are they really prisoners of war? Of course they are. Uh, they are volunteers, and volunteers are covered by the Geneva Convention, uh, which means they're prisoners of war. And their nationality has uh, no consequence as to that status because the third Geneva Convention makes reference to, to, to basically all nationalities being covered um, under the, the, uh, the, the Geneva Convention. So, of course, they're prisoners of war. Um, Russia is doing, you know, uh, what's been doing all the way up until now, which is distort reality. Uh, and, and use any means possible uh, in order to intimidate uh, and extract some type of concession. But yes, they are prisoners of war. But then uh, Russia says they aren't covered by the Geneva Conventions because they are not uh, um, regular members of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. They're not, they're not members of the Ukrainian Army. They are mercenaries uh, who have been contracted to fight for Ukraine and that in that capacity they are not covered. Although that was, that was also the same argument for the two Brits and the Moroccan who had been sentenced yeah. earlier uh, uh, after being captured by, uh, by the same authorities. They are part of the international group that is fighting there. They're wearing a uniform. They have designated insignias that is covered by the Geneva Convention. Russia is trying, again, to distort reality. And it's been doing that on a number of various topics related to, to its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this is just another one of those lies, basically, uh, and attempts to intimidate. Of course, they're prisoners of war. But do you see a situation where behind the scenes there are negotiations going on? Because indeed, uh, the American authorities, maybe a bit too late, had said that, you know, no Americans should go to Ukraine under any guise, either to fight or to, or to help. They advised against that happening. But of course, some of these people had already gone before that came out. I think the Russians are trying to perhaps use this as a bargaining chip to obtain some concession, maybe on sanctions, maybe on something else. Um, but I would be uh, very surprised, even for Russia, and even given everything it has done so far, if it were to actually execute these people, that would be uh, a war crime. Well, there are other things they've done since then which qualify as war crimes, depending on who you talk to. So why should this be different? Uh, that is a very good point. Uh, they have definitely shown in Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine that they're capable of, of war crimes. Um, you know, we're not, we are talking about American soldiers, uh, or American citizens, rather, and British citizens. Um, I think it remains to be seen just how serious the Russians are. Um, uh, again, I think... My sense is that what they're trying to do is they're trying to sort of use this as a bargaining chip. But the argument in and of itself is extremely flawed and extremely wrong and very dangerous. These people are foreign volunteers. They're foreign fighters. They're wearing a uniform. Of course, they're covered by the Geneva Convention. Speaking about bargains, uh, earlier this year, uh, maybe just a week or two after this war uh, in Ukraine started, the veteran, uh, what some people might call him the dean of uh, diplomats, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, had suggested that one of the ways to resolve this and resolve it quickly was for both sides uh, to be prepared to make uh, concessions, uh, including uh, perhaps uh, territory. Uh, uh, at that time, nobody was uh, really listening, and those who heard him actually poured cold water on those suggestions. But since then, uh, you now have the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, saying more or less the same thing. Uh, Emmanuel Macron had always said that the Russians must be given a way out of this. Uh, uh, do you think a consensus uh, is beginning to build around some kind of concession leading to peace uh, for this conflict? No. The only way out for Russia is out of Ukraine. Uh, the idea that, you know, perhaps Ukraine could give some territory in exchange for peace is extremely dangerous, and it wouldn't even solve the, 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 the problem. 
uh, what is there to say that next year or in two years or in five years, Russia won't come back and ask for more? And what, what kind of precedent would that create for the rest of the world? That means basically it would say that anyone with a big enough army uh, and enough power um, and, and a leader that is willing to be so responsible can actually take the territory of a neighbor. Uh, yeah. Conflicts all over the world would basically become even more so, even more uh, complicated by by this and, and this present it would say. Of but then, this uh, is not uh, this is not something that is that is viable. No, but on the ground, the Russians already control uh, uh, much of the territory that perhaps might be involved in concessions. I mean, they're already in full control of Crimea. Um, those that one has spoken to on the ground and who are looking at it. Uh, like yourself, have said that they will soon be in full control of most, if not all, of the Donbass. And these are the critical areas that seem to be in contention right now. The, so the facts on the ground already support this. Um, it's just that there isn't anything on paper to back it. Well, actually, even in the Donbass, the Russians are having trouble um, uh, making any significant inroads. Even there, they're being blocked out. Um, irrelevant and irrespective of what territory they may have taken in the southern part of Ukraine. That is an invasion of this country. Russia has invaded Ukrainian territory. There's no way that any responsible government would give to an invader territory and sign a, a treaty that would give them that territory. And it's up, at, at the end of the day, it's up to the Ukrainians to decide, you know, what a peace will look like for them. Uh, talking about unintended consequences, there is this uh, grain uh, food crisis, which has affected countries uh, which are not involved in any way in uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, but they have to eat. Their citizens have to eat. Uh, and uh, there have been quite a number of countries involved or trying to get involved in finding a way out of this, even while negotiations on the broader conflict continue. Now, basically, bare bones, it comes down to this. Russia wants sanctions on its own exports of uh, uh, grain and fertilizer removed so that it leaves the blockade on Ukrainian ports so that the grains that are now rotting away in uh, Ukrainian uh, silos can be exported. How viable is this? How, how can this go on? It can't. I mean, again, Russia is trying to distort reality. What Russia is saying is, yes, we are the aggressor, we invaded Ukraine, but the fault is with the one that's being aggressed. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not really how it works. Basically, Russia is, is holding the whole world hostage. Um, there are countries, of course, that are far away from the conflict and highly dependent on Ukrainian um, wheat and sunflower. Uh, for instance, Niger to, to, to Nigeria's north, 97% uh, of its imported sunflowers come from Ukraine. Benin to, to the West, you know, imports about 76%. Nigeria, for example, that doesn't really depend on, on Ukrainian, let's say, wheat. However, it feels the pain of, of, of the uh, food inflation, and that affects, of course, food insecurity. But this affects the whole world. And Russia is holding the whole world hostage and trying to get, again, concessions on, on sanctions. Um, it, it's a flawed argument because it is the aggressor. It is alone the cause for this food shortage. Western powers appear to be getting drawn into this long war. Uh, uh, nobody, not the Russians, not the West, expected that this would go on. By Friday, this will be uh, a four-month-long war. And there are those like you who have predicted, not you, but people like you, who have said that the war could go on for a year, possibly more. And all, uh, all eyes are now saying, look, we better prepare for the long haul. This is not likely to go away anytime soon. In the face of economic pressure, uh, inflation in the UK is at 40 year high, inflation in the US is at 40 year high, Europe is suffering all kinds of inflation because of high energy prices. There's a possibility of recession in some countries like Germany. Uh, do you see this uh, united front uh, in seeing this through uh, continue, regardless of how long it takes, uh, without some of these countries having to bend uh, because their citizens are really feeling the pinch? That is a very good question. And um, so far, yes, we are seeing a united front. 
Um, are we going to see United Front in the future? We certainly hope so. And we hope that, of course, our values and, and the norms we believe in and, and, and democracy, liberty, which is the fabric of our society, uh, will trump, you know, uh, these hopefully not so long-term effects. However, you are correct. Yes, there is growing inflation, and that is going to grow. Um, and uh, the economic situation will not get better. Um, so far, um, the West has seen unprecedented unity in terms of the way it responded to the conflict, in terms of the way it supported Ukraine. Uh, now we're about to have, for instance, uh, a council meeting uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow uh, between EU member states, hopefully deciding on, on candidate status uh, for Ukraine. Um, but it is going to be a long conflict, and it's going to definitely test our society. Before I let you go, you are, you are uh, in Belgium today. Uh, the last time I spoke to you, you were in Montreal. Uh, so I, I guess you now have the benefit of the perspective on continental Europe. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, looking at the public support for backing Ukraine, uh, in Belgium, of course, Belgium hosts uh, many of the European Union institutions. So it, it, it is a good place to feel, uh, shall we say, European uh, conditions. What do you think, what are you seeing on the ground in terms of the economic conditions as well as the perceptions or desires for peace and uh, on what terms? Are they broadly in line uh, with what is going on elsewhere or do people really just want to get on with their lives? I would say support in Belgium, other, other European powers as well as across the Atlantic and, and uh, the US and Canada is ironclad among the population. The population is definitely behind um, of course, everybody wants peace, but I think everybody agrees that this has to be a peace that is not putting a democratic country on its knees because of an aggressor. Indeed. Uh, Harry Nadelko, Director of Policy, Rasmussen Global, thank you for your, uh, for, for your presence and for your perspective this morning. Uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. After the break, Germany is on the verge of a second stage of gas standby measures. Please join us again.